You're listening to Trending with Timory, offering an eternal perspective on today's hottest topics. National speaker Timory Millington has been a passionate advocate for life as long as she can remember, helping Gen X through Z answer the call to true feminism and authentic manhood. Timory holds a master's degree in biblical theology, and she covers this week's hottest stories from a Catholic worldview. You're listening to Trending with Timory. So good to be with you again. With me is Dr. Philip Chavez. He is the founder and head of the Men's Academy. You can find him at themensacademy.org. So good to have you with us. It's good to be here as always, Timory. So I've really been looking forward to having you join us in studio because right now we are seeing a major attack when it comes to the issue of masculinity. Absolutely. In fact, you hear terms like toxic masculinity thrown around regularly. That's right. Just an initial reaction when you hear those words, um, and I don't know if you hear them in day-to-day conversation at all. Do you? Yeah, well, I wouldn't say in day-to-day conversation, but I, th- I seem to. It's it seems to come up uh, in what I'm seeing or reading or watching. You're right. You know, it's interesting because we talked a couple months ago about how the University of Texas on campus actually ended up looking at masculinity and labeling it a mental health issue on campus. So it's so difficult today because anymore men from the time they're little boys are being fostered essentially to be little girls. You have to draw the same pictures little girls draw. We have a zero tolerance policy. So if you're a little antsy in class and you get in trouble, zero tolerance, you know, you're expelled, you're suspended, whatever it might be. Um, There's a huge lack of compassion, empathy or understanding for masculinity, the masculine psyche, and even just the development of young men. That's right. And and even in, fi- in final, uh, how would I say, in final segue and all these things should be looking at, well, what are men for and what are they to do and what are they to carry out? And so if they, they were to answer many of those questions as to what a man's role eventually leads him to, then I think they would understand some of these characteristics. But these characteristics of manliness, it's of what they may call of top, maybe toxic or of traditional masculinity, they all have a purpose. And of course, I think most of the time people are accenting what looks like the defect of that quality instead of its positive aspect. Last week in studio with me was my old co-host, Trent Horn. We had hosted the show Hearts and Minds together. And when he was here, we talked about how the American Psychological Association just over the last couple of weeks for the first time has implemented new guidelines for dealing with men and boys. Now, the American Psychological Association did the same thing about 15 or so years ago for women in light of the feminist movement sure. and so forth. You know, I think this is a great thing to look at psychology, recognizing their differences between men and women. However, the problem is the American Psychological Association has said "Mm, manhood is a mental disorder. Traditional manhood, there's a problem with that. And this is why I wanted to have you here this week, Dr. Chavez, because I wanted to get your initial reaction to this. Absolutely. Yeah. And what's interesting, too, is that they don't speak so much about any kind of complementary or so how it works vis-a-vis a a relationship with a woman, which I think is tragic. But um, but yeah, it's it's a negative take across the board. In fact, I don't think there may not be anything uh, positive kind of teaching or or any aspects in the document. It all seems to point to a negative kind of uh, approach. Now, what's interesting in reading the wording from American Psychological Association, I mentioned this before, it seems like they're more so pointing to areas where there is serious male aggression and um, kind of disrespect and almost the formation of young men in an aggressive way, especially within African-American homes is what they're clearly pointing to because they even created a video titled Boys Don't Cry and it specifically depicts a African-American type of family um, where some of this, especially when there's fatherlessness involved, um, these attitudes are created. But what I want to do today with you here, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, well, in in those kinds of instances, again, I think what they're doing is they're just, they're looking at the defects and thinking that those are the the qualities of what traditional masculinity or what manliness should be or what should be exhibited by men. So it's so easy to look at the defect of men and not look at and try to find and establish too what's what's more positive about that manifestation of character. Well, and if you think about it, as you're saying this, it stimulates the fact that second wave feminism, what it did is it looked at 
femininity and the distinct ability to conceive children as the defect of women. Yeah. That you needed to be freed of your bonds of fertility. What is so fundamental to our relationships with other human beings is that maternity. They went after that with second wave feminism to really be freed of your bonds of fertility, to get rid of those shackles. Well, now the same thing's happening with masculinity. It's attacking exactly what masculinity is. That's right. And so, yeah, in the case, I'm trying to think about a parallel for for what be for men, but for women, with for what you just said, um, this is the reason why they're so uh, hard and bent on on establishing abortion as an absolute right. Yeah. Because in order to give that freedom to women, abortion makes that possible. Well, I think the same thing with men. I think, and it's part of the key pillars of your work is that it's taken the man's ability to provide away, That's his right. ability to protect away, That's right. and even just this attitude, this total, and we don't want violence for the sake of violence, but this total anti-violence, the inability to own a home, all of these elements are taking away some of the fundamental desires of men to provide a roof, to provide a home. And at the end of the day, these are the things women want too. Yes. So the irony is, is that some people are advocating against things what in some way they actually really want. So this is where there's a certain duplicity that's not really being seen. Well, wasn't that the study this past summer, mid-2018, where it talked about they pulled all these different feminist women and asked at the end of the day, like, what do you really want out of relationships? They wanted to be cherished, provided for, committed to. And these are the exact same things they recognize that the feminist mantra objects to. That's right. So although they said we want to be held equal with our husbands, well, we don't that want that much equality because we yeah. want to be cherished as different. That's right. That's right. So you can't have it both ways. Yes. Right? You so, can't have it both ways. So let's get into some of the meat of this. Because sure. here are the four areas that the American Psychological Association takes issue with. That's stoicism, competitiveness, dominance, and aggressiveness. Right. Now, these things, yes, can be taken to extremes. But we're going to talk about the good and sure. how you as men are called to live this out and how women are really meant to help foster this in the men and young boys that are around them. Sure, absolutely. And so taking this from uh, beginning to end here, starting with sto- stoicism, stoicism, I mean, in some way, you know, can make look at like the heartless, emotionless kind of stalwart male. But in reality, what, what I think that, that quality that really is being uh, in some way projected here should be is, is self-control and self-possession that a man should have. And, you know, we admire him, too, when he's able to keep his cool in inflammatory situations or in dangerous situations, right? It's nice when a man has kept his cool and he doesn't panic, right? And he's able to act. And so one of the giftings that I think a man has, too, let's tell the woman, a woman is, is very highly influenced by his, her emotions. A man is, too, to some extent. But he, is, he has an ability to put those aside and to look at, look at the reality for what it is. And so it may look when he's making certain decisions as almost he's heartless or that he's without emotion. And, yeah, as a matter of fact, he should be. I mean, certain things and certain duties, you know, when certain things are hard to execute, maybe in the family, a father can make a decision thinking, well, this really is for the good of the family. It may hurt little Johnny. You know, he's not going to get too worked up over that, but he's going to make a decision for the good of the family, even though it may hurt one of the members. And he's so he's not unduly affected by that. You know, in decisions of war, you have to make uh, decisions by which take a lot of self-possession, self-control, where you can't allow your emotions to get the best of you in those situations. Now, and this is a great example, because what you're talking about is suffering well, and not even necessarily suffering, but dealing with things well, saying, I I can take this. It, almost like that bring it type of mentality. Yet, for some reason, I think what the American Psychological Association is looking at is stoicism in the terms of, well, a man's, ju- a man's just expected to suffer without sharing his feelings. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it is true to a certain extent. Yeah, it's meant to, to show their feelings. And of course, uh, yeah, we've just heard a lot of talk of the, about that. But those feelings, yeah, need to be properly channeled. And so there really is a virtue to hold back feeling when trying to make us execute a certain act or even thought. Now, what would you say in response to people are saying, well, okay, you're expecting this is something great and good, the stoicism where there's the strength within the man to handle what comes at him with strength, right? With self-control, with respect for all of those involved to the best of his ability. Um, But what would you say in response to some people who are sitting here saying, well, 
how is he ever supposed to express and show emotion? Which I think is a silly question, but I want to hear your response first. Well, I mean, he can learn those things from his father, and there's other ways and, and means by which he has to express his emotion. I mean, it's, of course, he can be raised in a tradition which, um, which goes in the direction of being without motion. In fact, it's interesting, those in colder climates tend to manifest less emotion. Okay, and th- th- I think there's reasons for that based upon the climate itself. Uh, what, that's why we call you know motionless people cold because really they are from colder climates. Mm-hmm. But in any case, yeah. But there's uh, there's other ways men can express their emotions, and I think there are times. And I think it it is true to say in some respect that oftentimes men's emotions aren't properly fostered, which is really the duty of a father to properly move into the heart of a man and to open him up. And I think for the, for the lack of that, we've seen a lot of these extreme behaviors. That's Dr. Philip Chavez. I'm Timory Millington. I'm your host of Trending with Timory. If you're enjoying what you hear, you can head over to radiotrending.com. Turn your phone into a radio. You can listen to all the episodes, especially those where Dr. Chavez joins me regularly. So when we're talking about stoicism, I want to throw this into the mix here. Sure. So let's have it. Let's talk about how the American Psychological Association created this video called Boys Don't Cry. And it's showing a young black boy who is sitting here saying, yeah, my father told me, you know, you don't cry. You know, you're tough. You, you know, taught me to fight and so forth. And yet he said, well, if I cry, am I not a boy? Am I not a man type of question? When is an appropriate kind of a way to talk about crying for young men? Because crying in and of itself for a man is not bad. That's right. I think what the problem is that moping or inability to cope what true stoicism is trying to foster in a man. That's right. To harshly tell a boy not to cry is um, is to some extent, to a lesser degree, extent, I would say a lesser degree, is a kind of child abuse. Because, because to cry or to experience sorrow is a natural emotion, and if one cries in the midst of that, so be it. But there, is, there are times where boys do have to be taught as they're trained, more so than little girls, to kind of suck it up and to move forward and to uh, keep their cool, uh, to not pout, to not whine, and just take it. Because men have to do a lot of things by which they have to face the, the heat, the cold, the wind, the rain. Um, they have to face getting hurt. You know, um, um, they have to face, you know, I mean, I think it's important for men to learn martial arts. Every man needs to learn how to take a hit. So he has to learn how to take a hit without crying. So there are a number of things which I think um, men do need to be exhorted to toughen up. Absolutely. And I'm going to kind of juxtapose this with women for a second, because I think in some areas we think that women, there's this argument like, oh, women are very emotional. They may be emotional, but doesn't that doesn't mean they have to be mopey girl. You know what I mean? That's right. And, and you know, just a perfect example, I just gave the uh, maid of honor speech at my sister's wedding. And I had a, all my notes ready and I was practicing about a week before and I got really sad all of a sudden thinking about this. That's okay that I was sad thinking about, you know, memories or just missing certain things. So I'm like, I'm not going to cry in front of everyone because that would take away from what is happening. And you know, you, you mm, hear those brides, sure. and maybe you're one of those where you hear the bridesmaid speech and and you can't uh-huh. understand a single word. Grant, God bless her for being having so much emotion. But we, even women, need to have our emotions put in check. That's not the time and place to suddenly be crying and make it unintelligible. You know, like we, we need to be stronger than that as well in a different way. That may be true. I think at the, at the same time, it's also true that um, sometimes a lot of those tears, and you've been in those situations too, it almost acts, uh, happens spontaneously. Right. So, in fact, in some way, that's that's kind of the beauty of a woman that that sometimes she has a certain emotional spontaneity and that that can actually yeah look look lovely. And I I, okay, so I can agree and respect that in a sense. But I think maybe the problem is I think in our in our culture, things are indulged in for attention very easily. Oh, I see. And so I think that that's where it becomes problematic is that we have this such an internal look about the world anymore that I think I see so many women who almost do turn in, you know, and some girls do cry. I remember even at my sister's, you know, bridal shower, one of the girls was telling a story and she was so moved. Mm -hmm. She did cry for a second and she apologized. Apologize, and she was like, just hold on a second. She wasn't indulging in it and going on and on, but she was composing herself so that she can continue to move forward. And that's okay. That's fine. Yeah. But, but there's, a, there's a fine line where I think a lot of women are indulging. Yeah, and that could be. But yeah, these, these occasions too, one of the difficulty is they, they, they're just generally emotional occasions. You know, mm-hmm. it's hard to write rubrics for these things. It's hard, <laughs> it's hard to follow them, you know? 
And again, I think it's the spontaneity in a lot of these occasions, keeping in mind, you know, certain norms of etiquette and all the rest, but a lot of spontaneity in these occasions, I, I think is a beautiful thing. And allowing room for women to be in touch with their that's emotional right. side. And I think that that's something I really respect. And we've got to allow for that space still. That's right. Now, Kind of wrapping up this area of stoicism, with me is Dr. Philip Chavez. You're listening to Trending with Timory. I loved where you talked about how, in a sense, to just outright be like, you can't cry to a little boy. That's almost a form of child abuse. That Crying and emotion is okay That's in right. the right place. But being able to handle and deal with the situation is what you're saying men need to take on the strength and ability to do without being distracted in some ways. That's right. And again, as I mentioned, there's a number of things which men must do to, to kind of toughen up. And so you want a brave man in your life. You want a man who's not a coward, who can, who can take things. You know, the last thing you want in a man is somebody who complains about the cold, <laughs> or he complains his feet are wet, or he complains his hair is wet, or his jacket isn't warm enough. You know? so, I hey, see you toughen up. <laughs> yeah, toughen up, kid. So, um, but I think there's ways of exhorting uh, a man or young boy to, and, and lad to, uh, to, you know, to stand up and, and to not complain. And I think this is what he's called to. But but this has to be a, in some way a gradual thing too, and not punish it. You know, a child for you know, well, you know he's four or something like that for 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 doing what is emotionally correct him. Yes, but not 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 exhort him and so as to punish him or demean him in any way. Let's talk about the second issue that the American Psychological Association has pointing to mental disorder in terms of masculinity. That's when men exert or show competitiveness. That's right. Yeah, what's important, I think, in this is that, well, first of all, I think competitiveness is a virtue, okay? I don't think there's any vice in that, and uh, um, as, as long as it's done in good spirit and all the rest. But, um, you know, uh, there's the protector and the man that has to be built up, and so he's not going to be built up unless he learns how to be a protector. It's not going to happen. And so this is what every woman wants. Deep down, she wants a strong protector. And so men have to be driven with kind of a firmness to overcome obstacles, right? And a decisiveness for victory, a decisiveness in struggle. You know, if he gets in a fight, the fight isn't just a tussle. The fight's it's to win. And so if he's protecting you, you want him to win, not just put up a good fight. You want him to overcome. And so, so there's something about men when they go into things, they're there to win. And so to, to take that away from him is to, to strip him of something which it's his right to earn. It's a right, his right to act for, or rather his duty to act for. So as you think about it in Little League sports and so forth, where everyone gets a trophy now. That's right. Everybody gets equal time. Yeah. Yeah. That's unfortunate because it takes away from that spirit of competitiveness, which drives a boy to be better. Because if there's not, if there's not an objective good or, or uh, uh, reward to be had at the end, he's not going to be acting hard. This reminds you of one of our oldest pieces of literature, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Mm. And how in the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh ultimately isn't really challenged to do more or be more until he has someone of his equal that is another man to challenge him so that he's equally yoked. And that's when he finally finds friendship as well. Sure. Yeah. In, in fact, um, yeah. In fact, it used to be such that when two men stepped on a fencing strip in medieval times, they were friends for life. And so men, bo men bond through boxing clubs, things like that. I mean, when I used to box, yeah, you'd have these strong bonds that were just understood. So, yeah, the men you, the men you compete with are sometimes the men you become closest to. So what would you say when people say, well, competitiveness is taken too far? where competitiveness um, maybe becomes aggressive on the field. And I think that this is an important conversation because that's where I think a lot of people have issue. That's right. And I think what's happening uh, to that point, I think what's happening, and I think we even see this, you know, the last playoff games, I think people take... Playoff games are what? Uh, football. Football. <laughs> so I, I think what happens is I think we are taking uh, games a little bit too seriously. There's too much emotionally invested that I think it's good to be emotionally invested. I think it's good to have a spirit of competition. I think it's good to back up your team. But I think in some way there's such a spirit of excess today. And, um, and you see this cause, too, by players who act somewhat immaturely after making a touchdown or a good block or a sack or a tackle or whatnot. So um, there's a lot of immaturity that is involved today in sports with a proper understanding of, yeah, right play and good competition.
So you're saying the problem with when a competitiveness goes too far is a lack of maturity and development, more so of the individuals involved. That's right. But if I were to choose an extreme, I would say it's better to be a little more competitive than less competitive for a man. Mm -hmm. That's the better extreme. Well, and shouldn't young boys be learning the boundaries of competitiveness? For example, a little boy, and this is actually something Jordan Peterson talks about, how it's important for the cognitive development of children, for children to be able to play the rough and tumble play with their father, both That's boys right. and girls, but how it really develops the prefrontal cortex. And so what the little boys learn in that rough and tumble play with the dad is how to press boundaries, to anticipate that sure. rough and tumble play, but also to know that I can't gratify yet. I have to wait until dad gets home and wait until he says yes to play that way yeah okay and and to go to point to what you said you know um they're formed in a healthy competitiveness in the competition a father doesn't teach a boy in the beginning about how to really be competitive if he does it goes through you know one ear and out the other that's something to say about boys how they learn by doing they learn by doing that's right and so the lessons that fathers need to teach their their boys they could teach them some in advance i get all that but no the lessons are really taught in the midst of the activity or soon thereafter where they're corrected or they're steered right or whatnot so that's usually the way a boy is corrected in a spirit of competition that's Dr. Philip Chavez. I'm Timory Millington. The third area of concern that the American Psychological Association takes with masculinity, manhood as quote unquote a mental disorder is dominance. And I think this ties co- right in with the issue of competitiveness. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, uh, yeah. Isn't this is what women admire in some way the most in men that he's not willing to be pushed around? Yeah, there's a strength present. A woman never respects a man who he allows to push push him over, you know, uh, to to push some boundaries. So, um, but yeah, dominance on all things. Again, we could reach the extreme, but but these a man's supposed to develop qualities of leadership, uh, be decisive, um, to have a certain governance about himself. Uh, we had always admired man who can you know govern things well, whether it comes to you know running a football team or. Uh, uh, an auto repair shop or even his own family you know we expect a man to lead in fact we're disparaged and we're uh how would i say um almost depressed when a man can't lead when he's in charge of a certain uh forum that he's really not taking charge in well we have to look at the true meaning of dominance to have dominion and isn't right. that what god calls us to in the creation of the world that he creates adam and eve in his image and likeness and he especially gives Adam that dominion over all of creation to the point that Adam's naming all of creation because he's meant to, to exert that dominance, show that dominion, have control over what's happening. And that's the, with the fall, that's the struggle. Now suddenly man's going to have a more difficult time working within the world. That's right. And the dominance in that respect, too, is, is even some of the uh, instances I mentioned, there's responsibility there. You know, dominance dom- comes from the Latin dominus, which means Lord. So we call Jesus Christ. He was dominus, you know, and so he, he was the Lord. He had the responsibility of governance. And so so it's in dominance then is it, in this sense, in governance, sense of governance, leadership, direction. Uh, that's actually a virtue. Well, this is making me think you're going to laugh here, but of Downton Abbey. And you have, you know, the Lord of the Manor. They have this huge property and it weighs on that's the right. head of the household as he's having to sell off parts of the land. They're maybe having to suddenly create a pig farm or do different things on the land because not only does he have the responsibility of providing for his family, but of keeping the land and being able to keep the homes and the jobs for the people on his land. That's that's right. And if you notice in that series, he had great concerted attention for those under him, for those who served him. And this is how it was in the feudal system, too. You had the lords and their knights or the lords and their subjects. And there was a great mutual respect between the two. And so in this case, in Downton Abbey, this this man had a great sense of custody and responsibility that all those under him were well taken care of and provided for. A new way to look at the word dominance, to look at the way Lord, that I think that so often all of a sudden people object to dominance within masculinity, yet break down the word. What does it mean? What is the responsibility of that? That's right. And it isn't necessarily to lord over in some harshness. And, and I think this is what happens, I think, in, in, and we saw this extreme a lot in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 
where men were exerting too much of the harshness, exerting too much of the lion and not enough of the lamb. That's Dr. Philip Chavez. I'm Timory Millington. You can find Dr. Philip Chavez at themensacademy.org. Timory will be right back. Tweet them at Timory. That's T I M M E R I E. You're listening to Trending with Timory, where morality and culture meet, offering an eternal perspective on today's hottest topics. I have in studio with me Dr. Philip Chavez. This is a Trending. I'm Timory Millington. We're talking about the American Psychological Association and really the war on masculinity developing young men and that it's being labeled as a mental disorder. One of the topics that is brought into question is the issue of dominance. Now, Dr. Chavez, men are called to exert dominance, to have dominion over what they're interacting with. They're called yes. to be leaders, essentially. Exactly. Responsible, virtuous leaders. In fact, in, in the family, you know, uh, this is what a man wants to be known for, that he's, he's a good leader. You know, this is, and, and well, families in his business, um, if he's leading a sports team, he wants to be respected as a good leader. This is one of the reasons why St. Paul, he says, wives, respect your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. It's because, you know, if you're asking in a forum, you know, if men and women both, if they would rather be loved or respected, the men would say they'd rather be respected overwhelmingly, and the women would rather say they're, they would like prefer to be loved. And so in this case, um, a re- respect is, a, is very important for a man, and ultimately that's to be found in his leadership abilities. Now, in our society, this has not been modeled to many people. And so then they find themselves in either marital relationships or even in courting, trying to figure out what this looks like. In fact, young adult events are very often this conversation of, well, what does respecting a man look like? And it's an area that often you get, you know, 10 women together, eight out of 10 don't even know what to say. That's right. Yeah, that's unfortunate. And and yes, men do need to learn how to stand up more. They need, need to learn how to take charge. But again, you know, in an age, I think the number one boast of women is that they're independent, right? I would say that's the number one boast of women. I see that more than anything else in a feminism kind of spectrum. And so I, I would say that that seems to challenge a man in his ability to lead. It makes him question himself. It makes him not want to step up to that role. So how do you call a man into that mission as a woman? And then how do you step into that role as a man if you're already in a dynamic where that role is not being asserted? Yeah, this this is where it takes a heroic level of trust on the part of a woman. OK, that if she submits to this divine plan that that, you know, she is to defer to him as a leader she, and doing so as best she knows how. That's something that will um, that will affect him. You know, sometimes men, they won't lead or step up to things because they're not trusted. And so if you were to say, honey, I, I trust you in these things. I know you will be a good leader of our family. You know, I'm, I'm happy to follow you. I have confidence in your judgment. Okay, so men are, men are feeble in their own ways too. But if you can somewhat communicate these things to your future husband, you'll find slowly that it will empower him and it will give him confidence. And men move best in whatever they're doing when they're confident what they're doing and when others trust trust them and trust their judgment. And also this can be lived out in a marriage where the damage has been done. A way of living has already been taking place for a long time. But that starting with that few sure. verbal affirmation, right? Starting exactly. with the verbal affirmation, that pulling back, that respect. And, you know, it's going to take repetitive behavior behavior in order to develop that if you've been living in a different way or have never seen a model of this. That's right. And for this reason, um, men need a lot of mentoring in this regard, especially today in marriage. Men need a lot of guidance in the many things and responsibilities that they have because they're very lost or, or they're very unsupported or they don't know where to go. So in this way, it's good to, that a men, all men need another leader in their lives who guides them. In fact, a man needs a leader almost his entire life until his elderly years. And this is part of the reason why you founded the Men's Academy. That's because right. you were saying this voice isn't present in society right now. So although you might not be able to physically spend time with every single person, you want to start to create conferences, media content to say, exactly. here, let's find that leadership. Let's at least hear a voice of leadership. Yeah. And just to really come to understand uh, what it is. You know, I mean, there's a lot of talk about that we don't have good and strong men today, but we have to define ver- and be very clear 
on what it means to be a strong man. And certain qualities of leadership need to be enunciated to men, and they need to learn those things. Would you say that even just for men to start spending more time with other, you know, good quality men would be a good start? If you don't have someone maybe you can identify as a leader, just that time together is helpful? I think so. And, and I think on a number of levels. I mean, not only do men need uh, to love each other well in fraternity, because if, if a man learns to love his brothers well, he can love his wife much better, okay? But also, too, within, within, within these bond, bands of brothers, there's inherent competition, so it helps tough, toughen them up. But usually, too, or at least definitely it should be, and I know men aren't woken up to this as much today, but in men's groups, you usually find a natural kind of mentorship where the older guys will kind of mentor the younger guys. And that those give forums for the younger guys to finally, you know, take the older guys aside and say, hey, can I talk to you about this? Or can I run something by you? And most men, when they're asked for their advice, are almost too happy to give it. And I mean, yeah. I think one of the areas that maybe you're trying to start this up is, you know, a man today, you don't really have a lot of male friendships, don't have that mentorship. Finding someone to go to the gym with, finding someone That's to right. play basketball with once a month, like starting That's something, right. reach out in some way, some sort of regular activity, whatever it might be, to have that camaraderie. That's right. It's always best if a man can get that about once a week. Now, when he's married and he's busy with a family, it's sometimes hard. But a man should really try to commit himself to twice a month. And his wife should see that, yes, this is good for him. So a, a woman should always uh, let a man be with some kind of fraternal situation at least twice a month. Now, it's not too late. Father Tim Grumbach, one of my other guest hosts on Trending, and I were talking about the Exodus 90 challenge. Are you familiar okay. with that? Yes, I know. I know a part of it. I think I've read it through one time in general. What's the, the, the divisions of challenge? It's been a while. It's been about a year and a half, two years, maybe. Yeah. So a bunch of men across the country have just started that back up on January 20th. And so it's not too late to join in, but part of the program is that you have male accountability. It's for men. You're forming small groups. And one of the requirements is that you meet at least once a week. Mm -hmm. And that's there's that accountability that if you're going to try and break something in terms of the program that you're working on, whether it's, you know, not watching TV, using social media, not eating sugar, that you ask permission to do so. So I know a lot of the guys are asking permission, for example, to watch the football game, the Super Bowl game coming up. But that's one way. Way, one opportunity and maybe you start with one other friend that you start this challenge to be surrounded by other men yeah and that's the key word here is challenge right um you know we we just recently talked about competitiveness and um men need to be challenged in fact what's interesting is they rise up to challenge in fact sometimes they need that to get going and moving in fact they're not interested in things which aren't challenging when you really get down to it. Let's talk about this fourth issue, and that is where there's aggressiveness. So the fourth issue that the American Psychological Association had with manhood is traditional forms of aggressiveness. Can you define what aggressiveness would look like in a good way? Well, I think if we were to look at it in a positive way, we'd look at things like valor or bravery, or when a man has, yes, he has courage, but he's somewhat resolute and he acts. Now, this is key here, Timory. In fact, it was, wasn't until about 10 years ago it really hit me. One of the reasons why men may appear aggressive or act too quickly or be too, a little too spontaneous or ready to shoot out the gate too quickly is because he has to. In other words, there, there are incidents, you know, that could take seconds to save a life. And there is something inborn in a man to act very quickly. You know, a child is, is, is climbed on top of a fence. I remember one time I was in Rome and a woman was crossing a street and I, and she, would, she almost would have, would have ran to a bus that was making a turn. I just immediately, just not even thinking about it, just pulled her in back and yanked her back and she fell. Well, yeah, it was better falling than breaking <laughs> her legs or losing right. her life, right? So there are times when men have to act very, very quickly and spontaneously. It happens in war. It happens in sports. But it happens in life. You know, where your kids are in danger, you're in danger. Something has to happen. He has to move real quickly. So there's something inborn in him to act almost what, look, what appears to be rash, what appears to be not well thought out, what appears to be hasty. But that is in by nature to fulfill what he's called to be in this protective role. And in reality, it's showing a form of reverence for the people around him and that being fostered, that strong true. element of 
aggressive protection that aggra- that's right and maybe i think aggression is where the word gets hard because we don't think of aggression as a good word but this strong ability to protect with decisiveness that's right in this case what happens aggression then in in its negative sense is allied to a kind of anger that goes with this mm-hmm. okay so so when we think of uh, and most people when they think of somebody's really aggressive there's a kind of anger that's behind um, a quick or harsh or tough action, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's what a man has to control. And so it is true when when you when men are filled with anger, and we've we've all known people like that. That um, there's a part of all of their actions which looks too strong and too too harsh, too overbearing, too domineering, and that's when aggression uh, rears its ugly head. I love kind of just looking back at literature where you read, I love fantasy, not sci-fi, but fantasy. And um, there's a series I'm rereading that I read when I was a child. It's uh, by, written by David Eddings. And it, the main character is a knight named Sparhawk. And it's mm. always neat from the beginning to the end of the book just to see, in a sense, that aggression that's lived out, this just quick readiness to address whatever physical barrier might take place but there's this almost a bit of a sage element to him and who he is and there's always a self-control there as well and so i sometimes think maybe turning to examples even in literature are you know it offers us opportunity to question well why did they act this way how did they handle that well that's right and remember um men act quickly oftentimes because if they don't seconds count and it could mean life or it could mean death it's that serious what makes me think of that baseball game a few years ago where a baseball came flying into the arena and all the picture shows this ball coming right at a kid's head and now the the kid's totally clueless playing at a baseball game on some video game which is a whole nother conversation but a bunch of the dads just kind of stick out their hands i think his dad blocked the ball with the back of his arm but all the women in the area are curled up covering their faces to protect themselves yet it's the men naturally appealing to their masculinity reaching out to protect that's right a bat enters the room the women go under the table and the man is looking for any kind of weapon he can knock the thing out with instantly in, in, intuitively timory will be right back tweet them at timory that's t-i-m-m-e-r-i-e you're listening to trending with timory Dr. Philip Chavez of the Men's Academy is here in studio with me. We've been talking about masculinity. And I think a great example is being set by some of the Catholic universities and even some businesses right now to really shut down access to pornography. In fact, Dr. Chavez, a bunch of the Catholic universities that are on the Newman Center are starting to, base, sometimes based on a student's request, uh, put major pornographic blocker or blockers to porn on the internet access so that young people can't access porn and have it damage their intimate relationships and their psychological development. And their studies, too. Right, I mean, and their studies. They're realizing, too. I mean, the boys are, are honest enough to admit that, hey, you know, if, if this stuff is around, I'm, I'm not going to get to my studies and I could fail out. And no, that's not good. I, I got to get this stuff out. Yeah, so I, I think there's a number of reasons. I'm not saying that's the most important, right. but obviously the relationship morals more important but um but yeah i mean i think uh yeah men are starting to see how this is deeply affecting them and that something has to be done it's actually pretty cool because notre dame does not have filters on their internet programs there at the university yet but the university of notre dame students have been petitioning to the administration saying we want these porn blockers and it's because right. young people are seeing they're hungry for real relationships, but pornography is getting in the way. That's right. And it, yeah, it's it's harming everything in their lives. So I want to talk for a second, especially for parents to kind of be aware of this. I don't know if you know what deep fakes are, but it's essentially pornography. And they're actually really easy apps. For example, there's one called Fake App. I've not used it, but I know it by title, yeah. um, where you can take videos of pornography and pick a face and put any face onto it so that you're seeing a stimulated act of whoever you want, maybe not their real body, but their face is there. It's pretty scary, and I hear that too. More and more is that technology getting better. So I hear now, in order to, to make videos of that, sometimes there's a lot of manipulating, a lot of working with it, but but soon it's going to be where there's just going to be a simple transfer of image and all will be done. So that's, that's a scary thing to think that you could be so mi- misrepresented 
or your your identity hijacked in that way for a number of purposes. Well, in, in this fake app, it actually said that you don't have to have any type of programming skills. This one's even decently seamless. But it's sad because, for example, Scarlett Johansson who has been really the victim of this. And she said, you know, right. there's really nothing you can do. There are a lot of people being preyed on, essentially. But she's had over 100 or 1 million views on some of the different deep fakes of her that are pornographic. Yeah, that's very unfortunate. You know, um, she's making this an issue by which she's really standing on and she's trying to warn people of the devastating effects that are going to happen or things that are going to get worse if um, such things do not have some kind of control put on them. So this is a norm. This is something that's going to continue to grow in our society. I was just looking at a stat that's actually, I think, a good five years old that 75 percent of young Christian men are looking at pornography at least once a month. And that number goes up even more. I think it's somewhere closer to about 50 percent who look at it once a week. And it's a tough world today for women to find young men or future spouses or even their own spouse today who's not already looking at pornography. That's right. And so more so in a relational way, I'd like to talk about how we can address the issue of pornography in dating, romantic relationships, and what kind of resolution has to be made in order to move forward or even stay in that relationship. Yeah, you know, um, this is my opinion, but it's it's my strong opinion. I hold it very, very firmly is that if a man's to really move forward in a relationship with us, he has to get mentored. You know, I, I know of Christian men who've made it a big cop out, this may sound hard, to go to their pastor or a priest for guidance. You do not do that for a number of reasons, because you can always talk a pastor and a priest into anything or to excuse you for a whole kinds of things. And I can make some points about that later about life decisions. But in any case, no, it's like uh, somebody who's on alcohol or drugs. The only one who could really help you overcome that is somebody who's been immersed in alcohol and drugs. In so other words, addictive behavior is of such a nature that it needs mentoring, but it needs concerted mentoring and more so by somebody in the know. And so somebody who's caught up in in pornography needs to be um, honest with a mentor figure. This may sound a little strange, but be a little more honest with a mentor figure than the actual one they're actually they're dating. Okay, because sometimes women can't process the opposite sex sometimes can't process uh, the truths about the other. You know, it, it can be too much. Um, I think I think um, um, men should should confess, at least in certain general ways, without the specifics of what they've been engaged with, to be honest at the out front, because it is like having another relationship that women should know about. But at the same time, when it comes to the real remedy here, the real remedy is found when a man is guided personally by somebody who himself has conquered porn. Or if, if not that directly the case, somebody who does get, give him concerted mentoring. Because otherwise a man will feel, you know, if he's in a relationship, as you know, and your friends, you know, there's so many compelling things that make you want to stay in a relationship against your own good judgment. And most people need somebody with good judgment to guide them while they're in relationship. And all the more so, you know, when a man's caught in this addiction, that he does need help and he does need a mentoring as to how he's to proceed with the woman and to the commitments that he plans to make or hopes to make. Now, this mentorship as a remedy for pornography is exactly, I think, in a clearer form, what we talk about when we talk about a battle plan against porn is you have sure. to have accountability. I like, because I think you're taking it a step further. You're not just saying, hey, you need accountability, because I know a lot of people have, oh, I have my accountability partner for my covenant eyes, which if you don't know, is a fantastic filtration system that you can put on on any um, laptop, tablet, phone to help filter out porn where they send a little message to someone when you look at pornography, you try to break through the filter. Um, I think that those are great, but I think that male mentorship, like you're saying, is going to the next level where your accountability is someone who is able to help guide you through it, not just be with you through it. Yeah, and in this case, it's sometimes accountability becomes on a fraternal level. Mm-hmm. So so the, the mentorship comes on more of a, of a paternal level level and I think men need both you know they need the the effect of, of somebody with authority but they need somebody who's who's more of an equal who they become accountable to because men will talk to uh, the both of them the brother figures and their father figures very differently and deal with them very differently mm-hmm. And for which reason, it's always good too. I mean, to get the input from your brother figures and your your mentor figures about any big step in life, especially marriage. So a second ago, you just discouraged having a priest to be that mentor right. figure because you said that you know 
through maybe manipulation, you might be able to get the priest to agree to what's going on. Would you maybe recommend asking a priest, hey, do you, because some people are having a hard time finding mentors. What if you asked a priest, hey, do you know anyone who's battled or been through a pornography addiction who might be able to help mentor me or give me advice? Would that be one way to find a mentor? Like, what would you recommend to find this person? Yeah, I think I think it's an appropriate way because priests might be able to help or find somebody or or, or ask ask around and um, yeah and and two you know sometimes men are summoned by priests a little bit more effectively you know and so when they're told hey this young man here needs help he needs a job or whatnot usually men are more willing to act on the basis of uh, their pastor's you know insistence or recommendation or his request now and the reason too why you have to be careful with priests getting more direct into this issue is that. Um, Number one, I don't think priests really have the time or oftentimes the expertise to deal with these things, but they should They should give some, uh, a pastor figure should give uh, some mentorship on a spiritual level. I'm not saying they shouldn't be involved at all, but a lot of priests can easily be hoodwinked or give a dispensation pretty easily for a whole host of things. I've, I've seen this a number of times with people who have been engaged where they figure, well, I got the priest's approval. This is okay. I'm good to go forward and not really paying close attention to the core issues at hand. Well, and if you're maybe a woman in this situation and it's uh, the gentleman who's struggling with the porn addiction, holding a strong line, you know, we don't always understand fully how that pornography addiction is specifically impacting the man, but it's okay to say, hey, we need to put this relationship on a pause until you've worked through this further, or maybe they do have some sort of accountability with a mentor. You know, I think that you absolutely have to be praying to battle pornography addiction, but that's not in replacement of a mentor. That's right. And yeah, it's, we, we need those spiritual kind of aids too. Absolutely. But again, yeah, in, in fact, this is what makes it so complicated. I think men need support on a number of levels in order to effectively overcome this. The filters you're talking about, learning how to share with your band of brothers, being honest with a male mentor, getting the right spiritual formation, a spiritual support. All these things are, are vital. And I think that there are great resources, like we mentioned, at Covenant Eyes. There's also um, a restorative ministry called RestoredMinistry.com, and where Matt Frad works with the porn effect, talking about the impact on the brain, the relationships, the psychological development. So Matt Frad is an awesome resource as well. But again, I find a lot of people go, okay, I'm watching these videos, but I'm still struggling. I think that mentorship combined with a daily rosary or receiving the sacraments regularly, like you have to come at this from all angles. Exactly. You can't win the war with just one battle here. Yeah. And as you mentioned too, in some way, in some way the key word here is struggle, right? So it's not going to be it's not going to be easily overcome, so it is with some sense of decisiveness to overcome. It's uh, some sense of this may sound a little strange too, to a, a surrender to the struggle, that you got to surrender that yes, this is going to be burdensome and and will be willing to embrace that in that journey. We hate struggling today, yet in all of these issues, whether it's you're being called to a deeper sense of masculinity and exerting those different elements of competitiveness, of assertiveness, showing that strength, there's a sacrifice being made there, just like there's a sacrifice in overcoming that pornography addiction. That's right. And even, even this is why Christ took up on our sins, because he even showed us through our sins, we could find through them uh, ultimately some kind of merit and some kind of imitation of him. So one who overcomes such an addiction or any addiction really can follow the path of Christ, surrender himself, and, and that can actually be meritorious for the person. My guest, Dr. Philip Chavez, can be found at themensacademy.org. You can also find more links to the episodes where he joins us here on Trending at radiotrending.com. If you liked what you heard, you can leave us a message there or send us a tweet on social media at Timory. This has been Trending with Timory. To book her to speak or learn more about her guest, visit radiotrending.com. That's radiotrending.com. You can listen to more of Trending via the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or the iHeartRadio app, where you can share your favorite episodes.